Welcome to the Vin Armani Show. My name is Vin Armani. It is Monday morning at 10 a.m., and so it's time for us to get started. We're streaming live on YouTube at youtube.com slash Vin Armani. Also on Twitter via Periscope, at Vin Armani is where you can connect to my Twitter. And as well on Facebook, we are streaming live on the Facebook page of our content partner, Activist Post. So that's facebook.com slash Activist Post. We've got a great show for you today. I'm, this may actually be one of the most important shows that we ever do, and I'm not kidding. Uh, we've got news today about the extension of this whole fake news situation, the, the controversy that has now morphed into some weird Russian propaganda. Uh, we've got a very interesting sort of uh, prediction, a battle of prognosticators. It's uh, Michael Moore versus Vin Armani, so <laughs> stay tuned for that one. Uh, and an interesting story about some, uh, some new developments in the world of California mandatory vaccines. So, as we get into this, I will be joined, as I am every week, by my co-host and producer, Mr. Christian Reyes. Thank you, sir. How are you this morning? Thank God it's Monday. Got a great show. Yeah. We've got Peter Coleman coming back on. I'm excited uh, for yeah, that. Yeah, he's our first return guest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's, I, we have a really exciting discussion about agorism. I can't wait for that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, a topic that I've been wanting to cover. I actually, you know, I've been kind of an anarchist, voluntarist, libertarian thinker for many, many years. I would say pretty much the majority of my adult life. Um, but it wasn't until I discovered this concept of agorism, which is actually was first developed kind of like in the early 80s, late 70s, mm -hmm. early 80s. Right. I had just never heard about it until actually, you know, less than a year ago. And uh, it was it was at that moment that I was like, okay, there's some there's some real help. I really mm -hmm. uh, I, I really think that this this view is possible. This libertarian sort of stateless society is actually a possibility. So I'm excited. I'm yeah, me excited too. About it. Me too. I want to hear the details on how it works. And I'm very excited about that. So. And of course, Peter's always great. Yeah. You know, yeah, Peter's a, always a lot of fun. So very entertaining, <laughs> very entertaining guy. Um, and I'm sure that he'll have some other updates from uh, from Mises Institute as well, nice. which he's an ambassador for. Um, last week, our guest last week was Christina Hildebrand from A Voice for Choice, mm -hmm. and we talked about um, vaccines. Very important. Very so. important. And we had gone over a, a particular bill, because she's based in California, um, SB 277, which was the sort of mandatory vaccine bill. And after our show aired, uh, I, it may have been Tuesday, mm -hmm. I started to get uh, some tweets from people who were saying, hey, there's this other thing that's happening in California, this other oh, bill wow. um, that's been introduced by the same guy and can you take a look at it? And when I looked at it, it was, it, <laughs> I, found it, I found it interesting. It seems, it's one of those things that's very Orwellian, you know, mm -hmm. the idea of like a double think, yeah. where opposites, you use opposites to mean something. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, in, in Orwell's 1984, which I tell everyone, read 1984. In Orwell's 1984, you've got, um, you know, the, the, the slogans of the, the party that control everything is freedom is slavery, um, ignorance is strength, mm -hmm. and war is peace. Those are the three. And this one is, this one, it feels a lot like that. It feels very much like that. It's introduced by Senator Pan. He's a state senator in California. He's okay. the one who pushed through this SB 277. He's just introduced it. So it's brand new. I, it hasn't even gone up for debate, but it's one that I want to watch. And this is actually our, our first story. So this is California SB 18. The bill would declare the intent of the legislature to expand and codify the Bill of Rights for children and youth of California to establish a comprehensive framework that governs the rights of all children and youth in California. This is the opening statements of this bill. Now, 
that sounds like a great thing. Bill of Rights for Children and Youth in California. That sounds like a really, really good thing. Let's take a look at the actual text that has been introduced here. So it basically has these uh, seven, seven points that they're trying to get past and say that these are human rights for children in California. Now, number one, the right to parents, guardians, or caregivers who act in their best interest. So in other words, children have one, the right to parents, guardians, or caregivers who act in their best interest. Two, the right to form healthy attachments with adults responsible for their care and well-being. Three, the right to live in a safe and healthy environment. Four, the right to social and emotional well-being. Five, the right to opportunities to attain optimal cognitive, physical, and social development. Now, these are the ones that are interesting. When you, it's really, I think, one, six, and seven are the keys. So let's key in on those. So six says, the right to appropriate quality education and life skills leading to self-sufficiency in adulthood. And seven, the right to appropriate quality healthcare. Now, why these three are potentially important, being introduced by the same guy who introduced the mandatory vaccine bill, SB 277. Well, you have to understand, SB 277, here's what it means, or here's what it, here's what it mandates. It mandates that in order for children to enter into public school, they have to have um, the, a, a battery of vaccinations that are determined by the state, which vaccinations those are. If they don't have those vaccinations on their record, they cannot attend public school. Now, Christian, if you want to jump back to the text really quick. If, if number six, the right to appropriate quality education and life skills leading to self-sufficiency in adulthood, and number seven, the right to appropriate quality health care, if those rights are not met, and if those rights are determined to be mandatory vaccines, then you jump up back to number one, and what does it say? The right to parents or guardians or caregivers who act in their best interest. So Christian, what we're looking at here is a bill that when you combine it with the mandatory vaccines, you're seeing the state say, if you don't give your kids vaccines, these vaccines, so that we can provide them education, if you don't give them the quality health care, we say, and you don't give them the education, we say, it, so no vaccines, no education. If you don't give them the education that, that we say, then we reserve the right to remove you as a caregiver or, pa or parent to take Whoa. your children away because you're not acting in their best interest and they have a right to parents or caregivers who act in their best interests. Wow. I mean, that's potentially what that, that's what, it, that's what it looks like to me when I look at it. Yeah, that's exactly what it looks like and that's very scary. So we are going to, like I say, this is just, this is brand new. This has just gone in. We're going to keep our eyes on it. We're going to yeah. keep looking at it. But uh, if you want more information, if you want to jump back onto the, uh, to the text there, if you want more information, if you want to follow this, especially if you're somebody in California and you want some more info, you want to work against this, uh, you can go to a voice for choice advocacy.com. They're, they're taking up the issue and yeah, we'll watch this develop. It's, it's very Orwellian. It's very Orwellian. Uh, and we, that is not the only <laughs> Orwellian sort of thing that, that is going on, especially in our world. So over the past several weeks, we have been covering the escalation of the fake news controversy, which began as just fake news that they were saying we were putting out uh, fake or clickbaity news, <laughs> and then it morphed, it is now morphed into a combination of fake news and Russian propaganda. This is when it gets scary. So there have been several stories. The most uh, important one in this 
has been Washington Post. They've really been pushing this Russian propaganda narrative. And before I get into this next story, I want to just give a recap because the Washington Post, thankfully, did a very nice recap video trying to justify their uh, going after Russia uh, by showing all of the people who have a problem with Russia. So uh, this, is our, this is our next story. But before we get, so let's go uh, news number two. We're going to show this recap, Washington Post's recap. So news number two, Christian. I am going to lead the charge to investigate Russia's role, not only in the elections, but throughout the world. So I'm going after Russia in every way you can go after Russia. I think they're one of the most uh, destabilizing influences on the world stage. I think they did interfere with our elections, and I want Putin personally to pay a price. Of course, there's a history there of, there's a tradition in Russia of uh, interfering with uh, elections, their own and others. <laughs> and. Uh, so it shouldn't come as a big shock uh, to people. The fact that our intelligence services are now viewing Russian activity uh, as a potential threat against our electoral system uh, raises further questions about Trump. And uh, I think those are questions the American people should be asking and answering. And the way she talks about Putin, she's always said she has no idea, but she's always saying, Wikileaks. It's Russia <coughs> and Donald Trump. I have nothing to do with Russia, but <coughs> They said, maybe Donald Trump is involved in projects with the Russian. The answer is no, no. As far as Putin is concerned, I think Putin's been a very strong leader for Russia. I mean, he's been a lot stronger than our leader, that I can tell you. I mean, for Russia, that doesn't mean I'm endorsing Putin. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. I think you will probably be rewarded mightily by our press. When he was confronted about this on the stage in the last debate, what do you think about the Russian efforts to influence the American election? He said, there's no evidence of that. Why are you standing on stage and acting like Vladimir Putin's defense lawyer? I think Trump should take a real tough tone with Russia, because if he doesn't, you're going to allow Russia to be begin to break apart alliances. So. The propaganda wars are in full swing. So let's talk about what, what's happened this week. We've moved beyond fake news. This now Russian propaganda. Now I want to remind you that Activist Post, our content partner and where we broadcast, has been on all of these lists. Been on the list since the fake news that started with um, US News and LA Times and that uh, Professor Zim, Melissa Zimdars all the way through Washington Post, the whole prop or not thing that was also repeated by CNN. We've been covering this in the, in the previous weeks. They just don't want to stop. Uh, Washington Post, after having been ripped apart, decided they're gonna double down. And so this week, this week, they report on some, a CIA, assessment, a secret CIA assessment. This is the Washington Post. This is December, what is that? December 9th, Christian? I can barely, I barely see that. December 9th or 8th. <laughs> what is it? No, it's not December <laughs> On the byline? No way. That's not 11. That's just one number. <laughs> anyway, you guys can see it. They did it this week, okay? Secret CIA assessment says Russia trying to help Trump win the White House. Um, the CIA has concluded in a secret assessment that Russia intervened in the 2016 election to help Donald Trump win the presidency rather than just to undermine confidence in the U.S. electoral system, according to officials briefed on the matter. So this is the Washington Post reporting that there's a CIA assessment. It's secret. They haven't seen it, but according to some people who choose to remain anonymous, they heard that the CIA <laughs> said that it was Russia. <laughs> it's really, I mean, this, these guys are just the worst. And so, of course, and thankfully, as we've thanked Glenn Greenwald before for going after Washington Post for the prop or not, it's Glenn Greenwald, they put this out, and Glenn Greenwald savages them in The Intercept. Headline, 
Anonymous leaks to Washington Post about CIA's Russia beliefs are no substitute for evidence. So, quoting from the article, given the obvious significance of this story, it is certain to shape how people understand the 2016 election and probably foreign policy debates for months, if not years to come. It is critical to keep in mind some basic facts about what is known and more importantly, what is not known. What is known is nobody has ever opposed investigations to determine if Russia hacked these emails, nor has anyone ever denied the possibility that Russia did that. The source of contention has been quite simple. No accusation should be accepted until there is actual convincing evidence to substantiate those accu accusations. Now, the Washington Post, they, they, they put out these things, then they get savaged by Greenwald, and then they try to, try to retract. So then it, they doubled down, and then they, they just went ahead and they even raised again. We've got now the FBI, now it turns out, no, it wasn't just the CIA. The FBI also gave an assessment. But the FBI and CIA give differing accounts to lawmakers on Russia's motives in the 2016 attacks. So the FBI's remarks to the lawmakers on the House Intelligence Committee were in comparison to the CIA, fuzzy and ambiguous, those are, those are quotes, suggesting, that those in the, suggesting to those in the room that the Bureau and the agency weren't on the same page. My favorite part of this, uh, this article is this, you have the quote, the FBI quote there, straight from the article, you have FBI quote, the competing messages, according to officials in attendance, also reflect cultural differences between the FBI and CIA. The Bureau, true to its law enforcement roots, wants facts and tangible evidence to prove something beyond all reasonable doubt. The CIA is more comfortable drawing inferences from behavior. So, <laughs> Christian, the, the FBI it's so strange. They want facts and evidence before they actually say something might be true. <laughs> so what I'm hearing from this is you have two guys sitting down. You've got an FBI guy. You've got a CIA guy. They're briefing the House Intelligence Committee. The CIA is like, we believe Russia influenced the election. Mm -hmm. We believe Russia is influencing our elections. And the FBI guy goes, well... We don't actually have any evidence <laughs> that Russia is influencing the, influencing the election. But the Washington Post goes ahead and they run with their initial right, story. Yep. The initial story is, well, let's forget about the FBI. Because if we mention the FBI, then we have to say that there is no actual evidence of this. There's just the CIA saying, we believe without evidence. We believe without evidence because, oh, somebody's behaving in a strange way. But there's no evidence. This It's just... It's crazy. It's horrible journalism. Yeah, it's terrible journalism. Like, why are they wasting the, the, the words? Why are they wasting the time and energy except, except to do propaganda? I mean, this right. is pure propaganda, pure, right? Yep. This is not reporting mm -mm. at all. And the idea is that they're going to count, they're, they're going to counter propaganda. Now, it's one thing to have, it's one thing to have the Washington Post doing propaganda. It's one thing to have news outlets deciding that, you know, we've said, oh, it's sour grapes. Mm -hmm. You know, they're just upset that they lost the election. And then it's another thing when laws start being passed and the government, the guys with the guns, are swayed or moved by what's happening in the media. Or if they're not swayed or moved, they see it as an opportunity because public opinion is going in a certain direction to pass some laws wow. mm -hmm. to crack down. And we had discussed the House intelligence, um, House H.R. 6393, the Intelligence Authorization Act. We had discussed that, but something new happened this week. The Senate, this is Zero Hedge reporting, the Senate quietly passes the Countering Disinformation and Propaganda Act. 
Now, this is not the same bill. This is different. And this goes into, if I'm not mistaken, this goes into the, this does go into a defense authorization bill. And what it seeks is a whole government approach without the bureaucratic restrictions to counter foreign disinformation and manipulation, which they believe threaten the world's security and stability. Now, whole government approach is a little bit scary because whole government approach means military, law enforcement, intelligence agencies, the bureaucracies, the surveillance agencies, mm -hmm. the IRS, the everything, the whole government, right? They want a whole government. So this one could, this one could be even worse than the House. And this is this has passed, and this this has passed the Senate. So the, in the description of this thing, I. The, You've got it there as S2692 description. I, I just, I just want to go over this because it's, it's interesting here. So go ahead and throw up that. All right. So here's the legislation. This is what it does. It's designed to help American allies. This is, this is what these senators, Portman and Murphy, have announced. These, this is from them. The legislation is designed to help American allies counter foreign government propaganda from Russia, China, and other nations. And it's passed the Senate as part of the fiscal year 2017 National Defense Authorization Act conference report. It was a bipartisan bill. And what it does is it establishes an interagency center that's interagency, meaning the agencies we're talking about are agencies like the Central Intelligence Agency, the National Security Agency, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, housed at the State Department to coordinate and synchronize counter propaganda efforts throughout the U.S. government. This is, this is the quote from Portman. The passage of this bill in the Senate today takes us one critical step closer to effectively confronting the extensive and destabilizing foreign propaganda and disinformation operations being waged against us. While the propaganda and disinformation threat has grown, the U.S. government has been asleep at the wheel. Now, Murphy says, Congress has taken a big step in fighting back against, and here's the, here's the rub, Congress has taken a big step in fighting back against fake news and propaganda from countries like Russia. When the president signs this bill into law, the United States will finally have a dedicated set of tools and resources to confront our adversaries' widespread efforts to spread false narratives that undermine democratic institutions and compromise America's foreign policy goals. So Christian, Fake news for them, the guys who introduced this bill see it, see fake news as being a part of the target. And fake news is not, a, it's not, we've already established it's not even a real thing. Every yeah. time they all the lists have been destroyed and debunked, but they're still moving forward. They've introduced it into the narrative, they're moving forward with fake news. What do you think the agenda is behind it? What do they want us? What's the ultimate goal with that? Obviously, de obviously deconstructing independent news agencies and stuff like that. But do you, you think you have to? You have to be able. Look, in a state, in a truly powerful state, I think what a lot of people misunderstand is. You know, we're taught that our government's main enemy is other governments. Yeah. We're taught that in schools, that, you know, the government is our friend, that, that our government, and not just our government, but for instance, you know, we talk about the Russians. Mm -hmm. And we think that's, that's encompassing also the Russian people, right? We talk about the the French government does something and we say, oh, the French are sending troops to Syria. Mm -hmm. The French and the French government are not the same. Exactly. And yeah. if you look yeah. at history, 
more people, let's, let's take Russia for instance, right? Let's take Russia during the Soviet Union time or even, even, during, even during like the, the recent era and we just take one guy, take Stalin or take Hitler, right? The number of people, Stalin is, is suspected to have killed as many as 60 million wow. Russian citizens. You know, you take Mao, millions of Chinese citizens killed. Mm -hmm. Pol Pot, millions, the killing fields, right? Hitler, you know, they were, they were shipping people off to concentration camps who were under the aegis of the German state. German people were the ones who were at threat from those governments. Governments are not a threat to outside governments, for the most part. They're a threat to the people. They're, their whole job of the state, the state is like a farm. Yeah. It's a tax farm. And so the, if you, you want the tax farm to work right, you got to control the livestock. And part of controlling the livestock, part of putting the cage, the fence around the state, the, the fence around the mind of the livestock yeah. is you have to have control of the media. You have to have control of the propaganda. news, the propaganda organs. You have to have it. So that's what this is about. They're seeing that there are these other narratives like the ones that we are presenting. The truth is a problem. The truth right. is a big problem. 1984, ignorance is strength. If you look at what they're doing too, and what could be done with confusion. Confusion mm -hmm. is a perfect distraction for slipping something in right under the radar. Yes. So, you know, you look at this and I'm, I'm like, okay, I'm trying to figure out what's going on here. What are they trying to push? You know, what, what is it exactly? And it's a little confusing. And I think most people would look at that and, you know, if they're watching TV or something like that, they would get confused and they would say, what's going on? Well, that's... That's part of it. Yeah. The confusion is... A huge right I mean that the, the fact that it's confusing the fact that you can't figure out what's going on from from the information that they're giving you is it works to their advantage right because there's that moment in time where somebody's mm -hmm. just a little bit confused and you can slip in a command you can slip in something that would control or they decide to stop paying attention mm -hmm. Right, because often that's when things cease to be interesting I heard something uh, very interesting uh, Jordan Peterson, I hope to have him on in the, in the coming year, uh, professor at University of Toronto. He's been involved in this uh, gender pronouns controversy, but seeing him uh, with that, he's, his study is authoritarian regimes, and he's got some amazing lectures online. I would anybody go check him out. Jordan Peterson, he's awesome. But uh, I've been listening to one of his lectures about, about meaning, and he says that one of the things that, it, that we want that attracts our attention is we like the perfect we like the perfect combination of predictable and unpredictable yeah. like we like we like what we consume in terms of our entertainment be it music be it movies be it all of these things we want it to be understandable enough that we can basically follow it but unpredictable enough that there are some surprises that yeah. we didn't expect right but it's like take Take a movie, for example. You know, if you're watching a movie and you're like 10 minutes in and you're like, I have no idea what's happening right. in this movie. It's too unfamiliar. It's, too, it's confusing. You yeah. turn it off. Mm -hmm. Now, that's great for them. That's great if you're trying to pass through some draconian measures that are going to hurt the person watching. Mm -hmm. So here's the person. They're watching. They don't understand that what is being passed through is not in their best interest. But because they don't understand it, they tune out, which is why one of the things that I've, I've tried to do on this show, and I think that we've done it very well, is that we walk through these issues really mm -hmm. slowly. We try to explain all the way around it so that people can get a good grasp on it. Look at the details. And not just the details, but sort of deconstruct. Deconstruct, yep. And I think that that's one of the things that alternative or independent media does very well because we have the time to do it. Yeah. We have the time. And, and the freedom. And the freedom. We're not under deadlines. Mm -hmm. 
you know, we're able to work for the most part. Everybody's able to work on their own. We cover the stories that interest us. We take as much time as we need and we get to the bottom of it. That's not what they want <laughs> because they're trying to, to push through some very dangerous things. And so that's definitely not what they want. Now, on that note, this week, something very interesting was uh, passed off to me by the folks at Activist Post with a, a kind of a like, D dude, check this out. I think, I think you might find this interesting. Now, let me, before we go into this, let me preface this. We're going to show you a clip of Michael Moore on the Seth Meyers show. It was f basically from Wednesday night he was on this show. Now, I want you to, as you're looking at this, look at his body language, look at his tone. And it's a weird, on, in the context of things that were going on on Wednesday night, it's a very weird little segment that, uh, an interaction that Michael Moore had with Seth Meyers. So let's go ahead and uh, throw that. That is um, news number three. He's not president of the United States yet. Yeah. He's not president, right? He's not president till noon on January 20th of 2017. That is, that is, what are we, this is uh, Wednesday night? Yeah. So that's more than six weeks away. Would you not agree, we, regardless what side of the political fence you're on, this has been the craziest election year. It certainly has. Nothing anyone has predicted has happened. Yeah. Every, it, the opposite has happened. Yes. So is it possible, just possible, that in these next six weeks, something else might happen? Yeah. Something crazy, something we're not expecting. What is this? What is this? What is this prediction of something crazy? When I saw this, I was like, I don't, I don't understand. What is he, what is he talking about? His body language is so glib. That was the part that really got to me, was that I'm looking at this guy and I'm like, okay, here's somebody who's definitely tuned in and has contacts at the highest levels of sort of the Democratic Party, who has been obsessed with Trump, uh, throughout this this period has definitely not wanted Trump to get into office and he still is holding out hope I'm like as as much as I don't like Michael Moore um, he, there's just something about him that kind of gives me the the, the creeps um, he's a, he's a very intelligent guy obviously and he's very tuned in politically and Christian what what do you you what do you see in that? What do you see in that clip? Because you're you're very good at breaking down, breaking down body language. Yeah, it's very clear that he knows there's something up. He knows something, and he's uh, being kind of smirk about it. He's mm -hmm. you know he's putting it out there, but he if you the words say you know what if whatever, but his body language is definitely saying there's something there that's going to happen, and it's they know what's up. That little thing where he goes, what yeah. if? Yeah. What if it's this, it's this sort of, I mean, I've done that myself before, mm -hmm. right? And it's kind of like when you know you're right. Exactly. And, and you're kind of trying to, in, in a way, it's almost like you're almost trying to like embarrass mm -hmm. the other person. Like, what if, I mean, what if I actually am able to do that? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like when you know, then what, what if? I thought it, that it was really crazy. And this, it got me to thinking like, okay, what, what are the crazy things that could happen? And it turns out this is something I had actually thought about before. So Michael Moore made a prediction, but crazy things happening, crazy things happening. Well, it, it, I had made a little prediction back on Halloween the last time we had Peter Coleman on. Uh, and actually, what do we got? Vince Domus. Yeah, a little Vince Tradamus. Uh Why don't you go ahead and throw up that prediction from back Halloween? Oh, man, do we... Hold on. Okay, Christian, back it up, back it up, back it up, back it up. Uh, Christian, 
jump, uh, ju just jump out of that. Just jump out of that. Jump back to me. Jump back to me. Okay. This, <laughs> we just added this clip. Do me a favor, Christian, on the, on the clip audio for that, it should be the very last clip audio on the, on the audio mixer. Go to the audio mixer on your, on your left screen there, bro, on your left screen, um, and put the M. Be sure that the M is lit up on the very last audio chain down there. You see it? It should be M-A-B. Make sure the M is also lit on that one. Okay, now let's replay that clip. No, I, we, still don't, we still don't have the audio. We still don't have the audio, bro. Jump, go ahead and jump, to, jump back to me here. Oh, this is not good. No, 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 look over there, Christian, on the very last, the, the very last, go down, go over, to the right, to the right, to the right. See that one, the M, there we go. Now play it. <laughs> here she is, over in Israel, the first thing that she says, I don't think we should have pushed for an election in the Palestinian territories. Ele first thing she says is elections are not necessarily a good thing, right? Which goes against all of the rhetoric that, she's ev that her husband has pumped out, that she pumped out as Secretary of State. Democracy, democracy, we got to have democracy, right? Isn't that the propaganda that's always pushed out? Yeah. So here you have, straight from the horse's mouth, she doesn't think you have a president, a person running for office, who I think is going to end up in that office. I didn't say she's going to win the election, but I think she's going to end up in that office. I think it's very, very likely. Who doesn't think elections are necessarily good for everybody? And the second thing that she believes straight out of her mouth is, if you're going to have an election, you need to do something to determine who's going to win. Proof is in the pudding. Well, there we go. So Christian, what are, what did I mean? What did I mean when I said, I didn't think she would win the election, but I thought that it was very likely that she would become president. Now, there are some ways that this can happen. And the way that I specifically thought that it could occur is in the constitution, how a president is elected. Like we all know that there was that magic number of you have to get to 270 electoral votes, mm -hmm. right? That's on election night, everybody's waiting for that. Okay, right. so what is the reason for that? The reason is there are 538 total members of the electoral college. Now the electoral college is by, um, it's by the congressional, basically like your congressional districts. So there are 538 total electors up for grabs. You have to get 50% plus one. So that is 270. 269 would be 269, uh, 538 divided by two, 269, meaning you need 270. Now, if no one gets 270, some interesting things happen based on the Constitution. So, that's what I had thought and had in mind when I said that. Some weird electoral stuff. Because you have mm -hmm. to remember, Hillary Clinton's background and everybody that she runs with, they're all attorneys. Right? That's where she came from. She's an attorney. And everybody that she runs around with, all of her closest advisors, all of that, they're all attorneys. And this is not somebody who wants to, who wants to give up. Yep. You know, she's going she's gonna to fight to the end, and attorneys are going to going to use loopholes and don't think that, you know, being president and, you know, being the first lady and being involved that she hadn't thought through all of these sorts of things. So on Wednesday night, Michael Moore gives his little thing about what could possibly happen. And then on Friday, a suit is filed, but go to this article from Politico Electoral we have. A California elector files suit, joins anti-Trump electoral college push. Vince Kohler, chairman of the Monterey County Democratic Party, has become the 10th presidential elector, joining eight other Democrats and one Republican to lend support to the anti-Trump effort. His lawsuit, filed Friday, seeks to overturn a California statute 
that requires him and the state's 54 other members of the Electoral College to support Democratic nominee Hillary Clinton when they vote on December 19th. A similar lawsuit was filed earlier this week in Colorado by two Democratic electors, Robert Nemenich and Polly Baca. So, Christian, why don't you try to go ahead and get uh, Peter up, and I will try to lay out how this would work and what this means. Okay. What we have is we have a lawsuit. This is the chairman of the Monterey Democratic Party filing a lawsuit because he has to vote for Hillary Clinton by California law. Now understand this. This is a guy who is going to vote. Basically what happens is these 538 electors get together and they're the ones who actually vote. The electors are selected basically by the, uh, by the party and then whichever party wins the state, that's the elector that, uh, that goes on. So this guy is filing to, uh, I'm, hearing, I'm hearing Peter, go ahead and lower down, um, Christian, go ahead and lower down the TR over there. I think we should be okay. Christian, if you wanna jump in, since I see, I see you've got him, but if you wanna jump in over, over here with me, we've got this elector, who is a Hillary Clinton elector, filing a lawsuit to say it is unconstitutional it's a little, it's interesting to understand, saying that it's unconstitutional that he should have the right to vote for whoever he wants. That seems like a weird lawsuit. Very strange. And when I first looked at it, I was like, that is, that just doesn't even make any sense. Mm -hmm. But it does make sense if you take a little deeper look. So why don't you jump into the filing here? Uh, let's see, that's the jurisdiction. Go to the next one. I may have you jump around because these are in a little bit of the wrong order. So this is the filing filed in the United States District Court for the Northern District of California. It's Vincennes Kohler as a plaintiff versus Jerry Brown, the governor of California, Kamala Harris, the attorney general of California, and Alex Padilla, the secretary of state for the state of California. Uh, and Doe's 1 through 10. I guess that's, that's John Doe 1 through 10. So what is this, what is the lawsuit? If go to the next one here, uh, next actually, let's see. So this is the preliminary statement. And what they're saying is that he's seeking protection to act as a presidential elect elector, not merely by placing a ceremonial vote, but as part of a deliberative body, placing a vote that is most likely to ensure that only a person with the adequate qualifications for office be voted in as president of the United States. Now, 29 states have these laws that say all of the presidential electors have to vote according to the way that the state was won. So there, there's 29 of these. This is being filed in federal court. So any law that goes through here is going to affect federal law. Why don't you jump, jump back to that? Uh, and this, so this is the jurisdiction. You could see that it is, it's talking about the, whether or not the California election code, which requires electors to vote for that person for president and that person for vice president, uh, who are respectively the candidates of the political party that they represent that that particular code is unconstitutional they want and what they want to happen if you go forward christian right there they filed for a restraining order uh, they want an order entered declaring that the california elections code is unconstitutional and they want an order permanently enjoining the defendants from prosecuting any presidential elector on the basis of their vote placed for a presidential or vice presidential candidate. Now, this is, this is, a, this is a trip. This is a trip because as I looked at this, I was like, well, that, this doesn't, in a lot of ways, this doesn't make sense. Doesn't so, make sense. So if this goes through, even if this guy wins, 
he, okay, so he can vote for whoever he wants, but he's mm -hmm. still going to vote for Hillary Clinton. Like, what is this? And as I stopped and thought about it, I realized the true brilliance of what they're doing. It's brilliant. The true brilliance. This is about putting a restraining order on the ability of 29 states to vote, the electors from 29 states to vote, unless and until a final verdict is reached. Now, you got to consider this starts in this court. Then it gets appealed. If there's an appeal, it gets appealed up to the Ninth District Appellate Court. From there, it goes to the Supreme Court. Now, on issues like this, it's very likely to go to the Supreme Court, okay? Which means there has to be three rulings and two appeals. Now, you might say, well, there's a very good chance that, like, let's say this guy wins. Then the state of California just doesn't appeal, and it's all good. But there's a problem. There's a problem. Because we... Now, remember... They want an appeal to happen because they want to slow this thing down. Mm -hmm. How could you ensure that an appeal would happen? Well, what if you could set up a situation where no matter who wins, there's going to be an appeal? Guaranteed. Let's look at the defendants. Who are the defendants? Alex Padilla, the Attorney General. Oh, the uh, Secretary of State. Oh, there he is hugging Hillary Clinton. <laughs> He's supposed to be defending this next. Governor Jerry Brown endorsing Hillary Clinton. And the third one, our good friend Kamala Harris. <laughs> Join us. She's, I'm excited to stand with Hillary Clinton. So it's the fix is in. And what are we talking about in terms of dates? How long do they need to do this? See the dates. So on December 19th, the electors meet in their respective states. Okay? That's when the vote has to happen. December 19th. Now we're at what now? What is, what is, what is the date today? The 12th. The 12th. That's next Monday. The electors have to vote by next Monday. Because by December 28th, the votes have to be received by the president of the Senate. So if they can prevent, if they can make this go on for at least two weeks, two weeks before it hits the Supreme Court, and it's not even hit the Supreme Court, it has to hit the Supreme Court and then the electors have to vote in order to get this thing to the President of the Senate. If, if these 29 states, if they don't get there, then Congress meets in a joint session to count the electoral votes. If there are not enough votes, this is what happens. If no presidential candidate wins 270 or more electoral votes. Now, the Constitution does not say that every state has to, has to be in. It does not say that this happens whether, the, it, as a matter of fact, it, it, it's totally, it would be totally constitutional that if this just didn't happen and they didn't get it in in time, then here we go. And if they manage to block those 29 states from voting, if no presidential candidate wins 270 or more electoral votes, a majority, the 12th Amendment to the Constitution provides for the House of Representatives to decide the presidential election. If necessary, the House would elect the president by majority vote, choosing from the three candidates who received the greatest number of electoral votes. Well, there were only two that received any electoral votes. So that is Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. The vote would be taken by state with each state having one vote. So it isn't by Congress. It isn't by the majority of the Congress. It's one vote per state. Per state. So there, it's conceivable that there are some states where, and, and it doesn't say how this is decided. Like probably they would get together as a state delegation and they would decide amongst themselves. But there, I mean, you think about that, there could be horse trading. Yeah, the Republicans aren't all gonna go for Trump. No. There are, there are Republicans who hate Trump in the Congress. There are Republicans that were going for other candidates. There were a ton of other candidates. There are Republicans who, who said, I refuse to vote for Trump. 
So this is a situation, and I mean, again, it's the establishment talking with the establishment. Mm -hmm. This is a situation where, as Vince Stradamus predicted, you could have a situation of, she didn't win the election, but she becomes the president. The vice president, by the way, is voted for by the Senate. So you, it could be interesting. You could have a Hillary Clinton and Mike Pence. <laughs> wow. Actually, weirdly enough. So this is going to be the first time that this, something like this has ever happened. It's never happened. Never happened before. Never happened. On top of that, all the other stuff that just happened with this election, mm -hmm. you know, what we've learned through WikiLeaks, all, you know, everything that was brought to the, to the forefront. Now the, the fake news stuff. Now look at what has turned out from this election. And it's wild. I think we haven't even seen the real shit show. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I think you're, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I hope, I hope that that this doesn't happen. But, you know, I was thinking, I was saying to myself, oh man, I hope these judges, you know, mm -hmm. make the right decision. But the problem is, even if the judges make the right decision, if it gets appealed, that basically like nullifies the, because it's about the time, right? It's about a restraining order being placed, saying nobody can vote until we've got this figured out. We're not gonna, we're not gonna place votes until we've got this figured out. And an injunction against that, which is definitely going to be leveled while it gets appealed like it has to be. Mm -hmm. So they've got two weeks to get it through the Supreme Court. And if they're filing additional motions that take time and asking for extensions, oh, we need an extension on this. Like, I really feel like you have both sides of this and all they're trying to do is delay it. Yeah. And it's legal. It's constitutional. They're working within all the laws. It's not illegal. It's a hell of a loophole. Mm -hmm. It's a hell of a loophole. And as I looked at these things, yeah, I think it actually probably is unconstitutional for those 29 states to even have those laws. I don't know why they have those laws. Those laws don't make any sense. No, it doesn't make sense. But they're there, and they've been sitting there, and they've been a time bomb. So, I mean, this is something we'll, we'll definitely follow yeah, it. Yeah, we'll cover this. And, yeah, I mean, by next week, we should have some, we should have some more information. But... <laughs> The one thing that it, this is all going to do, and I'm glad, is that it's going to make a lot of people take notice and become a lot more cynical of the state, a lot more cynical mm -hmm. of government, and maybe be looking for some other alternatives, And as people who are watching this show already are. And that's why I'm very excited about the guest that we have coming up, Peter Kalman from the Mises Institute, an ambassador there. And we are going to have an awesome discussion about an awesome topic. And we will be right back with our guest, Mises Institute Ambassador, Peter Kalman. Welcome to the Vin Armani Show. We are back. We're streaming live on YouTube at youtube.com slash Vin Armani. On Twitter and Periscope, uh, at Vin Armani, that is my Twitter handle. And we're also streaming on the site of, uh, excuse me, on the Facebook page of our content partner, Activist Post. That's facebook.com slash Activist Post. And I want to send a special thank you out to the folks at Activist Post. I believe this is our seventh or eighth show. They've been great. They've curated all of this news. They keep us up to date. Go and check out ActivistPost.com uh, for really, I think, some of the best fake news <laughs> that you could possibly get. Um, but right now, I would like to bring on our guest, and our guest for today is Mises Institute Ambassador Peter Coleman. 
Uh, Peter Coleman is an uh, ambassador for the Mises Institute, founded in eight, 1982, which teaches the scholarship of Austrian economics, freedom, and peace. The liberal intellectual tradition of Ludwig von Mises and Murray N. Rothbart guides them. Accordingly, they seek a profound and radical shift in the intellectual climate away from statism and toward a private property order. They encourage critical historical research and stand against political correctness. The Institute serves students, academics, business leaders, and anyone seeking better understanding of the Austrian School of Economics and Libertarian Political Theory. Peter Kalman, welcome back to the show. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me again. So you are the, you are our first return guest. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm stoked on it, man. You, you honor me with this, oh, with this first, role. Look, uh, it's, it's always a lot of fun. I got to tell you, you have gotten the, the best sort of uh, audience response people have been like he's awesome peter's awesome so we had to have you back on we're gonna do it i think consistently and you're the right guy to have for concepts because i you know we do we do the show we talk about a lot of concrete concepts we talk about a lot of current events um but you know the basis and the place that i'm coming from is a libertarian self-ownership, individualist standpoint. And there's a lot to cover there. There's hundreds of years of philosophy. Uh, a lot of people, I think, think that this is some sort of new idea, but I guess as we both know, it's, it's not new at all. But right. I think that th yeah. this is a great forum for us, to, for us to discuss this. So today I was hoping that we could dig into some possible solutions, especially with all the things going on, you know, people become a little bit disenchanted. I hate to present problems and no solutions. Yeah. Yeah, that's, and that's something I run into a lot, getting into libertarian theory and, and anarchist theory specifically. Um, people always complaining about how terrible things are, and it's so, you know, oh my God, the state's so horrible, what are we gonna do? And what are we gonna do is the question no one had an answer to. And that's how I started to seek out and find more about agorism, um, because I was looking for the, okay, what now? We know all this is terrible. What do we do? You know, uh, some of my friends were doing political activism, um, you know, through the Republican Liberty Caucus at following up the Ron Paul campaign. And that, that to me, that was like, okay, I'm going to fix the problem with more government. Like that's, that doesn't seem right. Um, and I was really looking for something outside of the system that I had a problem with, something that completely took me away from the problems I perceived towards, like you were saying, more towards solutions. So, yeah, I was really, um, I was really lucky to uh, come across these ideas a couple years back, and uh, yeah, I'm excited to talk to them about. Okay, uh, so about so let's you. before we talk about the solutions. Let's talk about the problems as we see them, because while Absolutely. we while we talk about, you know, I mean, this show, I this show is all about keeping people informed with sort of the weirdness that's going on. And those things are problems. But the reason why we're able to find these things and see them as problems is because we we, we as anarchists, voluntarists, individualists, whatever you want to call it, we look at what's going on and we, we have some idea about the state and a desire to have a stateless society, Anar which is what anarchism means. Right. But when people talk about the state, I know that defining the state is a big thing at the Mises Institute, I mean, uh, Rothbard, I mean, Anatomy of the State is one I would definitely suggest people to go and, and read. And uh, The Law, Bastiat, is another one where he defines the state very, very well. Uh, if you would, if you could, just give people a definition, um, simple, that they can understand of when we talk about the state, what are we talking about? Um, okay, yeah, from my perspective, the state is, um, legitimized crime. So they are a group of people who have, um, who profess that they have an exception to morality. And I think more importantly, the thing that differentiates a state from an actual gang um, is that the state has a perceived legitimacy from a lot of its uh, subjects. So, but basically it's a predatory entity um, that doesn't produce anything. And in order to uh, take action requires uh, stealing from others uh, and or, or people willfully 
contributing to uh, its funds. Um, and it does this through taxation, which from again, from my perspective, is a form of theft. So um, a state is a group of people with um, with the perceived legitimacy to steal, uh, calling it taxation, the perceived legitimacy to kidnap people, uh, calling it, you know, being under arrest or, or law enforcement, um, and the perceived legitimacy to kill people, which is what, you know, they call war. It's a perceived... Or, ex or execution, right? I mean... Right or, right, or, yeah, capital punishment, yeah, or just, or execution on the streets. If a cop is trying to kidnap sure. you and you resist, you they have the sure. right to kill you. And it's not just the power to control people, as Larkin Rose puts it. It's the it's the right. It's the it's the perception that it's legitimate that they use force to control you. And as we talked about previously, as a voluntarist, I believe all human interaction should be completely voluntary, and no use of force is permissible, uh, except for in self-defense. You know, if you're defending yourself from someone else's use of force, that's permissible. But um, that the initiation of violence is unacceptable. And that's the state holds a monopoly uh, on the initiation of violence, uh, the, mor the moral initiation of violence. Um, and that, you know, uh, that's essentially um, the right to murder, steal, and kidnap. Uh, and, you know, it's, um, uh, your, your topics earlier today were, were cracking me up over here because, uh, you know, talking about uh, the CIA, uh, you know, being part of the intelligence community, talking about uh, oh, Russia, Russia influenced our elections. Right. One of my buddies, one of my buddies tweeted out, uh, oh, the CIA, an organization known for espionage, overthrowing governments, and influencing elections abroad, is claiming that Russia did that to us. Right. You know. So <laughs> even within states, there's arguments about oh, well, we're allowed as a state, we're allowed to wage war unconditionally, but we're allowed to influence other people's elections. We're allowed to overthrow dictators. But, you know, that other state, they're wrong when they do it. You know, so there's even an inherent contradiction in statism. Um, but uh, well, I think that they, I think the inherent yeah. contradiction aspect, you know, I, it's it's either, you know, for better or worse. When you read libertarian writings, you read uh, anarchist writings. And we, I mean, we experience this ourselves, right, in, in being sort of public anarchists or public voluntarists, that mm -hmm. there's always the debate. It's always the same debate. If you read the writings, uh, like, you know, it was great when you came on last time and recommended Bastiat's The Law. I hadn't read it, you know, but uh, really? here, yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't read it before that. But here's a guy talking, you know, like 160 years ago or something like that. And he's having, you can tell that he's having the exact same debate that we have uh, with people about, you know, the state having a monopoly on violence and and the initiation of violent force being immoral we're not going to have luckily we don't have to have that debate one of the things that i find the, the most frustrating is that we actually have some very good solutions but we end up spending all of our time rehashing the same debate and the people debating against us and there are probably some people watching right now who are saying but that's they've got their ideas right because they believe in the state Believe me, you'll get past them. There are, I, I, would, I would urge people, if you, if you don't think that these questions have been answered, to Google statist bingo <laughs> and look up images. <laughs> because uh, it's a little game that we anarchists play because when you, you can, it's basically a bingo card that you lay down and you start talking about exactly what Peter has just said, and then you just let the status, the person who believes in the state, just keep talking, and you can actually play bingo with their, with their arguments. That's how old all of the arguments for the state are and how, they're, they're, how I feel illegitimate they are. But what's great is we don't really have to talk about that today, so we're just gonna assume in this conversation that everybody is already agreeing with where we're at. And that way right. we can step through this whole thing. And I think it's actually of great value to the people who actually are in support of the state because you can just watch this. You know, if you watch this and watch it with an open mind, understand that when you're done, you can always go back to whatever, but watch it with an open mind and see, see maybe what you think about that. So we've got the idea of the state being violence, personified basically, a legitimized, immorality.
Right, like Bostia puts it, legal, legalized plunder. Legalized, legalized exactly. plunder but is But what you said is great. Yes. I mean, they need to steal to do all the rest of the things, right? So right. They, they tax so that they can get enforcers right. who can enforce their taxes, and then they can steal more and do more things that are right. bad. Um, it, but it's like it's a great way to put it. You said legitimized, moral, or legitimized immorality, you know. Um, it's uh, – and it's it, – you know, the, the arguments in the bingo card is, well, what about all these things that the state gives us? Well, all those things can be our argument from not just an anarchist, but from an, uh, an Austrian economist and from just anyone who has any common sense that hasn't uh, just taken for granted what the state programming and propaganda has been saying their whole life is. All those things the state provides are not actually provided by the state. The state pays for them after right. they take out a cut, after they take out their their paychecks and, and, and the amount of money they're going to pay themselves. And then they pay for the services after the fact. So basically, agorism and in, in hand, Austrian economics kind of says, we can just pay directly for those things. We can pay right. a private company for roads, for security, for um, protection insurance companies, you know, um, for, for basically uh, for schools, for lights on the road, for, for literally anything that the state uh, provides through their monopolies, through their enforced monopolies. Those can be provided by the market by a group by by a group of people providing things on a voluntary basis uh you know with competitive contracts and not only can they be provided by other people they can be provided better by private people because they're gonna like i said being put up for competition so there's you'll have five options for who you want to uh you know pave your road and whoever gives you the best deal and you hear from yelp that they do the best job you know you you can pick the the best uh, suitor for your needs instead of this blanket, you know, you'll get what we give you, uh, you know, you're paying for it, but we'll decide who does it. And we'll like in New, in New Jersey, you'll pay $2 million per mile for the roads and they'll have potholes in them and you'll like right. it. You know? uh, <laughs> well, hold on before we get, before we get too far though, down, down that road, because that is definitely where we're going. And I think that there is a huge, uh, huge, huge argument for sort of from a more functional side that definitely a stateless society is better but right. my at least for me my justification for wanting a stateless society is i is is a is a moral one right like mine yep. is that okay regardless actually of whether or not i would be able to choose five people to do the roads maybe i maybe i couldn't choose anybody to do the roads because there are definitely some things that the state does that a stateless society can't do like global warfare right right, right. <laughs> so so it's not that i want a, a substitute to do all the things that the state does i'm just saying i don't want immoral institutions like that a moral institution is better than an immoral institution. And one of the reasons why, the main reason for me is, as you said before, the inconsistency, the logical mm -hmm. inconsistency. Like the, that the state is basically moral immorality, right? If you could say, like if you say legitimized initiation of violent coercion, you're saying moral immorality or ethical immorality and for me mm -hmm. that's a that's a it's an internal Oxymoron. contradiction right and whenever yeah. you have and maybe it's just my software development background maybe it's because i have a philosophy background and i'm i really enjoy logic but whenever there is a a, a logical inconsistency in something whether it's software code whether it's in architecture whether it's in the laws of physics. I mean, you think if you're building an airplane, you're testing this airplane and the aerodynamic, there's something in the aerodynamic aspect of this airplane where you're like, uh, there is an inconsistency, a logical inconsistency happening. You probably don't want to put that airplane in the air. Right. So if I'm going to live my life, I want to live my life with logical consistency and with ethical consistency and with moral consistency. Um, so, you know, what I would like to talk about is for those people who now, I guess, so we're here, it's all of us, we're, we're all anarchists and we're like, okay, stateless society, that's what we want. We want something with some moral consistency. You know, what I want to talk with you about is, let's talk about some of the ideas because I feel like this is the steps that people go through. For me, the first thing was, 
I want a stateless society, so let's destroy the government so that you could have a stateless society. Let's talk about why that's a problem. Right. Um, well, you know, they, they've got the monopoly on the initiation of force and violence. And they've also, like I mentioned, this is the most important thing. They're perceived as legitimate by a lot of people. So your actions towards destroying them, whether directly or indirectly, are going to be perceived. And even this stuff we're going to get talking about, agorism, it's, it's going to be perceived as wrong because it's illegal. You know, um, there's, but you're bringing, I mean, you're kind of gl getting close to the concepts of like prohibitum malum versus prohibitum in se. Talk, you know, talk is, to us about what those mean. So, or malum prohibitum malum in se. Malum prohibitum means bad because it's prohibited. Okay. And malum in se means bad in and of itself. So there's hmm. things that are wrong in and of themselves. And those are all the things the state has a right to do, actually. Right? Murder, Murder, theft. theft yeah. Kidnap, rape. Um, and then there's bad because they're prohibited, malum prohibitum, which is all these things that the government says, you, know, you, you can't do those unless drugs. you get permission from us, you know, yeah. unless it's what we approve of you doing, right? Drugs, yeah. uh, you know, uh, self-ownership of your body, you know, mm -hmm. uh, like you were talking about vaccines earlier, not, not putting the right drugs into your body is somehow wrong because they say you have to. Mm -hmm. um, not paying, not, not letting yourself be stolen from, you know, uh, you're a tax evader. That's like... Uh, Growing up, that was like, oh, he cheats his taxes. It's like, whoa, wait, you know, he doesn't. You mean he doesn't get money taken from him every day? That's right. that's why is that bad? So right. um, these are the, the, that's sort of you know um, how I started to realize like, wait a second, like all these things that I'm told are so bad my whole life. You know, I, uh, and, and I was a I was a really I look like this now, but I in high school I was a straight edge. I I didn't do drugs. I wasn't going to drink till I was 21 years old because. No, that's that's wrong, and that's you know I can't do those things. But but then you look at all these laws around the world, and oh well, this country it's it's like in California they legalize marijuana, and right. like okay, so suddenly the pot that's in my desk that was illegal before, right. now as of today it's legal, or no, as of January first, excuse me, that pot's still illegal until <laughs> until something magic, until someone wrote something on a piece of paper. To, to reverse something they had previously written on a piece of paper, neither of which things I agreed on or had any say in, y y you can see where, you know, like you're saying, logically, this isn't consistent. You know, um, I, I, if the, in the law, they talk about, um, you know, laws should be to protect people's property and, uh, and, and their person. Um, you know, if, if a law is, is protecting uh, the state against me or, and my property, then then th there's a there's a problem there. It clashes, you know. And of um, course, the state can have neither life because it doesn't have a body, nor property also because it doesn't have a body, right? Like ult right. ultimately, you can't. If you're not protecting the in property of an individual, there's the logical inconsistency again, right? You can't protect the property of a state because the state is just a group of individuals having certain behaviors, right? Right. Well, and who, right, they claim, they you know, they're, they're representative of everyone. Well, they're not, you know, they, they represent their own interests. They represent their own self-interest. Right. And, and when you start, like, war being, a per war is the, the number one example for me. Is like, when I realized how much money is spent on war, our income, our federal income tax entirely goes towards the national debt. Majority of the national debt is war, mm -hmm. you know, our, our military budget. So mm -hmm. it's, it's it, while it's wrong to avoid taxes, if you're against war, it's actually wrong from your own ethical standpoint to, to pay your taxes because right. you're paying for war. Right. People say, oh, well, you, what, you don't like education? You don't like, well, no, roads, education, all these things that are, that are good that the state provides. I mean, they're, they're not good versions of those things, but they're, they're, they're morally good. You know, uh, th those are paid for by property tax. Those are paid for by gas, direct gasoline taxes. Those aren't right. paid for by income tax. Income tax is pretty much a war tax. Right. And when you look at it that way, I mean, I, that was what motivated me to start looking into ways to avoid contributing to that because I don't like contributing to the murder of poor people in other countries. I don't, I don't, I don't like contributing to the murder of anyone. And, um, you know, that is what kind of drives me personally to want to learn agorism, to want to practice agorism because it's, it's a practice. It's a, it's a way of living your life so that you can be free from the state's, uh, you know, 
the, the, sta the state's edicts, the state's uh, demands, and, and because that's what they are. They're making demands for money. That, that's, that's what a tax is. It's, it's give us your money or we'll put you in a cage, and if you don't want to go in that cage, we'll kill you. you know? A law is don't do this thing that we say you need permission to do from us without this piece of paper or this, you know, this paying this fine, and if you do, then you're allowed to do it. Well, I, I don't want to ask anyone for permission. I'm a, a free people don't ask for permission to do anything. Um, well, no, I think a lot so. of people also don't understand that every single law, at the end of every law, no matter how small it is, is your death. At the yep. end of every law is the state killing you. And what I mean is this, and I've, I've given this example in little rants that I've done before, but I mean, I'll, I'll give the example quickly now. Tail light, your tail light is out on your car, right? This is what, $10 fix it ticket, something like this. But it's like, okay. So somebody says, well, that's just, a, that's a minor law. That's nothing. And I say, no, that is a threat to kill you because here's the reason why. If I don't pull over, if, if, the, right. if the cop gets behind me, my tail light's out and I don't pull over for my tail light being out, what happens? Now, now I'm evading. Now they're chasing after me. It's become a misdemeanor. Now what happens if, you know, when my car stops, I jump out, I run, the cop chases after me, and, but I decide I'm not going to jail. He tackles me. Right. Then the threat is, okay, if I'm resisting arrest, he has, a, he has the authority now to initiate some, some violence on me. Now, not me attacking him, but me just resisting arrest, trying to get away. Don't resist, don't resist. He can tase me. At that point, we know a lot of people get shot, right? I, you can get killed right then. But, but it's like, but if I, if I fight at any one of these times, there is the state initiating deadly force and violence for a tail light out. Absolutely. But I, I, would, I would caution then because a lot of people, you know, I don't want to use any derogatory terms, but a lot of people that really love the state, state hardcore statists, mm -hmm. and, and that, you know, from our perspective, I guess that would be a bit derogatory, but people who really truly believe in the myth of government will say, well, you resisted arrest. That's a very serious offense. It's very serious to resist arrest, you know, and, which is totally screwed up in and of itself because there are people I know, I know lots of people from the, my foot activism, you know, when I'm, I'm at protests, when I'm, when I'm most of the time for police killings, who are arrested for resisting arrest. So your, your, your crime is you didn't want to get arrested for right. the crime of not wanting to get arrested. And it's, it's again, right. cyclical, non-logical. But you can go to your example of having a, a taillight out, and you can look at Philandro uh, Castile, uh, mm -hmm. which happened just in Minnesota this summer, I want to say. Right. Uh, he, had a, he had a taillight out. He had a, a $10 fix-it ticket taillight out, and he got pulled over, and he was asked for his license and registration and insurance. And when he reached for his wallet, they shot him. He right. reached for the wallet that contained his license, his state piece of paper that gives right. him permission to drive, that he has is required to show by law, and he didn't break a law. He went. He was trying to follow a law, and he was shot and killed. And there's a video of it where they don't even rush to get him medical uh, treatment because he's clearly dying. Like they they just know there's no point now. Right. Like he's they they're bus they're probably too busy thinking of ways that they can frame this guy. Oh, it's. Like the Dave Chappelle skit, let's spring some spring crack, some on, crack on him, right? Yeah, you know, get get this guy out of here. Um, and so that's the really scary part, you know. Um, I mean, and I don't want to sugarcoat this or put it lightly. What we're talking about is enough to get you killed, you know. For um, sure, yeah, no. It, 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 well, I mean, it and it has tr less than this has been enough for the state to imprison or kill you in any number of countries. Um, right. You know, I've been reading Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago, and the things that people were, Ooh, were so good. killed for or put away for for 20 years in Soviet Russia, so uh, writing a letter to your buddy, you know, or, no, or literally nothing. Like your neighbor saying that, oh, they heard you say something and you didn't, and you're gone. Yep. You know, so it's like the state, that's, and people are like, well, that's, that's Soviet, but it's like, no, that, that's just... A state is a state is a state is right. a state. It, they just have a little bit different rules, a little bit different government. But if you give them time, and I think that we're seeing it happen in the U.S., give a state time. Just give it a little bit of time, and it will get to totalitarian because that's how states go. They've there's got a monopoly on violence. There's, there's, there's black sites in Chicago that have there been exposed. Go. 
you know, you don't even have to get into the FEMA death camp, Alex Jones territory right. of, you know, that's psycho babble. There's, there's places in Chicago where they, they bring people and they're off. It's like a little mini Guantanamo there. There's Guantanamo Bay, which, you know, sure. Obama you promised he was going to close and then renovated with $190 million renovation like a year before, you know, a year ago before his term ended. Right. Um, there's, there's all sorts of examples. Um, but it, it, the key thing to point out is, is these people are being, you know, no matter what you're arrested for, if it's agorism, if it's having a taillight out, whatever, you're not harming anyone. That's prohibitum, uh, a malum prohibitum. It, these things are illegal because someone said so. And they, they weren't illegal at one point, and they probably, in fact, I can guarantee you they will not be illegal someday because that's what we're doing. We are, we are getting rid of this illusion and this myth in people's minds that certain groups of people have the right to tell other people who are peaceful how to act. Well, um, I can you know, tell you the taillights, if we go to all automated cars, there will be no need for taillights. Sure. Because yeah. you'll uh, never have oh, to tell somebody biggest, that you're stopping, right? <laughs> that's that's a huge – and that's – when we get to the agorism in practice, yes. automated cars are going to screw them up so badly. It's going to really mess them is, up. That's why they're that's They're going to lose so a against. lot of money, a lot oh, of money. All, all of their local budgets are going to be eviscerated yeah. by this. That's how local governments sustain themselves, by robbing people on the streets, which is hilarious. And I pointed this out in a previous article that people say, oh, well, we need the government to build roads. And in actuality – the roads are the mechanism by which government robs people mm -hmm. the most. You, you know, I've, I've only been mugged one time. It was a very polite guy in San Francisco. He mm -hmm. took out a knife and said, hey, man, give me 20 bucks. And I gave right. him my wallet and he goes, no, nah, man, I just want 20 bucks. I'm not trying well, to Well, that's very, a, very polite mugger. The most polite mugging of all time, of course, San Francisco, right? <laughs> right, but right, right, if, right, and, right. And I always ask people, you know, how many times have you been mugged? Most people say zero. One or two is the yeah, most I've usually, ever heard. Yeah, yeah. But, but how many times have you been pulled over by a cop? Oh, how many God. times have you gotten a ticket? I can't, I can't even count. How many times have you had money taken forcibly from your check every day? Sure. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm, yeah. I have $64 stolen from me every day. The Absolutely. first four hours of my day until lunchtime, I'm working for the state every right. day. Right, right. So, and we, you know, we brushed on this uh, on the last time when I was on your show. Um, and, you know, and so, you know, ultimately I, I started searching for ways around this. Um, you know, the, the term black market's always been, you know, familiar to me. Um, the term gray market is something I learned through reading, um, but you know a good a, just I I didn't learn I didn't start this way I found out about agorism just. Well, by so so let's so wait so let's back up because I think now is now we're about at a point where we can I think start talking about agorism but just just to just to reclarify, so agorism I often tell people and, and I think this is maybe a good place to start like. For people who know a little bit about Karl Marx, I, I, I sometimes say that like, agorism is to voluntarism or anarchism, a stateless society based on voluntarism, as socialism is to communism, right? The idea that Marx had of communism was it's this beautiful utopia where is everything's abundant and everything's automated and no one has to work and everybody just has so much abundance. But how do we get to communism? He said, well, here's this thing, socialism. And socialism, the gov taking over the government, moving all of the, the means of production into the hands of even fewer people than they were in before at the top of some sort <laughs> yeah. of communist party, right? And we've seen how central planning, we've seen how horribly that's gone. We know that does not work, right? Right. So I often tell people agorism is that is kind of that bridge because socialism is really it's a practice right and agorism is kind of a practice in the it idea of absolutely how do we yeah. get from here to no state and right. uh samuel edward conkin was a guy who was writing a libertarian who got sort of disgusted with the formation of the libertarian party in the late 70s and said the way is not through government there's another way and as you've as we've been pointing out uh, you know, basically through the examples that we've given, his basic thesis was that the way to eliminate the state was, and he called it agorism, uh, meaning agorism coming from agora, which is the open marketplace. But he right. said that the way to eliminate the state was exactly as you've been saying, that it is to sort of starve the state, in essence, by taking away its, its ability to steal from right. you. 
and, and it, primarily to not give it money, right? Out, I'll, I'll let you. I'll let you continue on well, thought. Well, no, yeah, no, you're absolutely right, and it's to disobey, right? So right. it's civil disobedience, which, which I, you know, it, in retrospect, has really been what's solved all, a lot of the problems of the past century of, sure. of total government. You know, uh, with the civil rights movement, that was, uh, you know, Martin Luther King and, and Rosa Parks, all civil disobedience. No, we're not. No, like you know, I love that meme. Rosa Parks, I quote, like, nah, like I'm, we're <laughs> right. not doing it anymore. We're just—that's the idea, you know. It's being, it's disobeying civilly. Um, you know, I'm not hurting anyone by voluntarily interacting with someone else and excluding the the warmongers and the thieves from from that interaction. So um, it's it's a practice of civil disobedience uh, that utilizes what Konkin termed as counter economics. And it's, you know, it's not counter like, oh, it's, it's not like the opposite of economics. He actually based his economics on economics. He was a big fan of Murray Rock. No, no. And he, and he mentions them all in his book. Hello? Yeah, we got you. I think we, you there? I'm hoping that we're not glitching to a point where this thing's about to go bye-bye like we've had it do before, but can, please it continue. Been, yeah, it, fan it, of Murray it Rothbard, been, I think we got you. <laughs> yeah, it might've just been my, my like tablet going into sleep mode or something. Okay, um, perfect. But he, 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 he coined the term counter-economics, which, um, you know, he, he actually, it's not against economics. It's like counterculture. You know, it's just a different, uh, it's a different set of culture. It's a different set of economics. So, uh, through civil disobedience, um, you you can trade peacefully and freely, and and just and just disobey the commands. You know, you disobey the command to to contribute to the state. You disobey the command to tithe, to give a percentage of of your of your worth and your income to to this organization that claims you know stake in your existence, that claims ownership over your property. And that's really what it is. It's the full realization of self ownership. That, to me, that's what agorism is. It's a practice that allows you to fully own yourself and your personal interactions with other peaceful humans without a third party stealing or getting involved uh, or, or even regulating what you do. Um, you know, the, we believe the market is self-regulating. If you look at things like Yelp, uh, which you know, has rev customer reviews, Amazon as well, or even Uber, which self-regulates using you know, a rating program. Well, that, dude, an I, th I think the best one and the one that should be that people should take the most note of Uber's Uber Uber is definitely great, but I think for me it's Airbnb, and I think oh, yeah, that yeah. I think that you have especially young women all around the world, and I say young women, and you, you'll you'll see why I specifically say young women. But you've got young single women around the world who are going and staying at strangers' houses, and nothing's and they're safe. Yep. This this you would think of all of the sort of interactions that the state might have an argument and really get people like, the, oh, you absent that, are you kidding me? We have to regulate that. This young, your daughter, you're gonna let your daughter go? Oh, no, and there's, and there's around the world, they're Ubers. going to other countries and staying yep. in somebody's guest bedroom while a right. guy is in the other room. <laughs> right, and there's parents that send their kids in Ubers to, to, to their after school programs. There you go, exactly. There's all, these, there's all these ways that technology, and that's, that's really been the, the, the boom in agorism. I because agree. Konkin wrote this stuff 25, 30 years mm -hmm. ago in the 70s. And, and you know, a lot of the criticisms that came about of it were all in the 80s and the early 90s before the internet. But thanks to the internet, we have infinite possibilities with this. And I actually wrote, you know, I, I told you I wrote something about uh, mm -hmm. this topic. Um, I, I cover a lot of what we're talking about in there. I'm going to publish it like probably right after this video. Okay, it seems like we'll, it's put, a, we, we'll put a to link to it on my Twitter and uh, Facebook. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, well, I want you to read it too. But um, oh. but you know um, the the the, ver the 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 book that uh, Konkin wrote is right here, the New Libertarian Manifesto. Um, it's an ode to again to Murray Rothbard's Libertarian Manifesto um, he, uh, for New Liberty. But he actually mentions specifically in this, you know, Murray, uh, F. A. Hayek, and uh, von Mises, and their Austrian economics. And he and he basically says, you know. Um, free markets are available to us right now. They're black and they're gray, like the flag behind me. Um, the colors represent black markets and gray markets. And real quick, a black market is a market for uh, things that are deemed illegal by the state. They're not, again, they're, they're malum in prohibitum. They're, they're not evil in and of themselves, but uh, they don't hurt anyone except for maybe the user, but, um, but they're, they're banned. And that can include right now. That can include, you know, heroin, cocaine, crack, meth, 
and marijuana and you know what alcohol in some places in some states not and United prostitution states. as a service Pro certainly gambling right. gambling uh have, having sex with someone for money unless there's a camera right and then it's then it's pornography then that's legal right. um as long as there's a production company they can tax right that, so basically i like to put it as the black market is a bunch of things the government hasn't figured out how to tax yet right um the gray market is to me where it's even more interesting and there's even more opportunity um, the gray market is a market of legal goods that are traded illegally. In other words, they're traded without the permission of the state. So uh, if I sell this couch on Craigslist for $80, yes. uh, gray market. And, I don't pay, and I don't pay taxes on that $80 income that I receive because the guy comes to my house and I give him, you know, I give him the couch and he puts it on the back of his truck and he drives away mm -hmm. um, and there's no state involvement, I don't see a point in paying them anything. That's technically illegal. Now, anytime you buy your friend uh, dinner and they Venmo you, uh, you know, here's here's 80 bucks for that steak and the wine we drank, you know, technically that's income of yours. You're not paying taxes on mm -hmm. it. That's a gray market activity. So you can see how very quickly everyone's actually a little bit of an agorist, you know. Anytime you uh, help your buddy out and he pays you, you know, 40 bucks for a couple hours of your time moving, his, or, you know, you, you go on, you you, you uh, answer an ad for something under the table or off the books, sure. that's yeah. that's gray market activity. So there's a, a myriad of ways that, um, I mean, and there's even entire communities set up that are entirely black and gray. Uh, there's, um, there's, you know, the people abroad, there's seasteading, right? There's people in Costa Rica setting up farms, but there's even people like down in Texas, there's this, uh, setup that, um, I don't know if you saw this, but at the Rangers game, uh, open season opener of space ball season, a guy was wearing a bright yellow shirt that said taxation is theft. And he was right behind no, that's the That's kind of awesome. That's pretty yeah, awesome. Yeah, he was right. He was right behind the catcher's mound. And every time they showed a pitch, this guy was standing up just as proud <laughs> that's as can awesome. be showing that's off awesome. his shirt. This guy I found out is named Corey Watkins, and he set up an agorist community in Texas called the Texas Freedom Grounds, where basically they have homes, they have you know farm equipment, they have um, you know I, I don't I don't know all the different services they have, but they have different people fulfilling different roles in society. They have they have magically they have roads, you know. Wait, and how did they get roads? I know, right? Who built uh, the roads? Well, witchcraft. It's what they use witchcraft. I think, <laughs> Who built <actually>. the roads? <laughs> um, they, you know, they have all they have. They've set up all these ways that people can peacefully interact. You there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay, cool. Yeah, Did just you... skip for a second again. Okay, yeah, um, no, we're good. So, so, so basically, like, I mean, this is this is happening all around us, and and like I said, everyone's a little bit of an agorist because everybody will take that twenty dollars an hour under the table. I mean, happily, you know. But I'm, well, I mean, great. that was kind of Conkin's idea, right? He said, right. He said, the, look, these two things exist. He was obviously already a libertarian philosophically, and he had studied the economics, uh, the Austrian economics, and he had studied anarchist thought and libertarian thought. He was heavily involved in sort of the pre-libertarian party sort of libertarian movement. And then he himself was like, man, these gray and black markets, they totally exist. The idea of agorism is, and I think that it's really what you're describing is, Here's the gray and black markets. We know that they exist. You, you mentioned Craigslist. I'm sure there are a lot of people who are selling stuff on eBay who aren't reporting uh, what comes in. You know, there's Airbnb. I'm sure a lot of those Airbnb people are not reporting. I would just be sure the majority are not, that they're taking that tax free. Los Angeles is the first place. I'm in Los Angeles, and they're the first city to start regulating Airbnb. And I actually randomly met someone who worked at Airbnb, and this was happening like five or six months ago. Hmm. So they, they're just start they're just starting to figure this out. And here's the thing. Now there's there's eight copycats of Airbnb out there right. that have popped up that allow you to use your property. Your home right. is your property. And you can use it however you want. You can have people stay there and pay you. And the state has no involvement in that. Imagine imagine using your property in right. the way that you want to use it. Imagine that concept. So here, so here we have these gray and black markets, and they seem to be growing, and the blockchain and cryptocurrencies are oh, even yeah, more yeah, so yeah. making them grow, right? I think that that's a key part, and it's something that we've talked about on the show, obviously, and I, and I love. Konkin's idea and the idea of agorism, what is agorism then, is the libertarian thought combined with the black and gray markets combine them together, and they become the weapon against the state. That's the right. weapon. It's right. nonviolent. It's, it's moral. 
because it's your property and you're doing with your property as you choose. You're having voluntary interactions with people, so that's moral. There's no violence involved. And yet, it slowly but surely starves the state and replaces those state institutions with voluntary private ones. Right. And I think Bitcoin is actually the most important um, because ultimately not using the, the number, the most powerful monopoly that the state has besides its monopoly on violence, which, you know, we, we can we can replace security with, sure. you know, private options also. But the monopoly on the on the currency that people use for trade is enormous because that's basically their tentacles are now in everything. Um, you know, and, and you can use gold and silver, but those aren't as convenient as, you know, in, in the day and age that we're in with digital, with the yeah, digitalization. Yeah, you can't do gold and, gold and silver over the internet does not work. Right. But you can use Bitcoin and, or, or Ethereum or any cryptocurrency, but Bitcoin is the one to talk about because it's, you know, it's very easy to use at this yes. point. There's wallets that are set up. Sure. Um, you can, you, it's encrypted. So, you know, you've explained this in previous episodes. You can send money without the state being aware of how much to who or why. Or, or how even, you know? And that is the ultimate, that's the game changer. That is the end. That's the end of, of our ownership by another group. We, we compl when we completely own our interactions with other people and our pro ourselves and our property and the fruits of our labor, that's when we're truly living free. So I always say agorism is a practice for living free now. And, um, you know, uh, Konkin was writing in the 70s. He had no idea about the internet. He had no right. idea what was going right. to come. But he was such a he was such a visionary, you know, to be able to to coin these terms and to start because again he didn't invent agorism. He invented no. the word agorism. Yes. He didn't invent counter economics. He yes. coined that term. Yes. This is I'd argue and I argue in my in my article that these have existed since the state's inception. As soon as this as a group of people started stealing from people, there were people trying to avoid that theft. <laughs> for sure, know? for sure. <laughs> and 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 so I mean and and I uh, you know Dan Sanchez says that civilization precedes the state. Um, there there was people peacefully trading mm -hmm. at, to, in excess and creating prosperity. Mm -hmm. And that's what a group of people saw and said, wait, we, we want to steal. They have so much extra. We're going to steal from them. Right. And then we're going to use that money to enforce our theft. Right. And that's how the myth of the state started you know, thousands of years ago. But we are at a, a crucial point in time where that's getting reversed. And it's getting so fast. I mean, there's like Bitcoin prices going through the roof. I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. it's not as high as it was when it really boomed, when it first got that big pop mm -hmm. in the media. But with the, the Indian currency debacle where they're, they're banning uh, large currency notes in India with a billion people not being able to use their funds, uh, we're seeing Bitcoin go through the roof because the, state, the state's failures are being uh, corrected by the private market. You know? right. And that's what, that's what it comes down to is privatizing everything will lead to a more efficient, a more utilitarian, but more importantly, a more peaceful existence for people because as you take away the state's ability to collect from uh, from your from your income, you're taking away their ability to spend on murder and killing people, which is that's their that's their game. That's they they, they create the fear, and then they and then they promise to protect you from it, but it's really just them the whole time. Um, so I think with what we have happening in this country right now, and in the West in general, I think a lot of people are are fumbling around. I think that that's what a lot of the social justice warrior stuff is. I think that's what the alt right stuff is. I think ultimately what it is is that people are disillusioned with the way that the system has been Absolutely. set up, with what they've experienced, and that they are looking around for some some different way of doing things. Unfortunately. On the social justice warrior side, they've basically just rebranded Marx and socialism. Right. And right. on the alt-right side, they've just basically rebranded fascism. And right. it's nothing, those are not new, they're just new brands on immoral statist activities. And, and it's so ironic, it's so ironic that the social justice warrior's answer is socialism because, and I've, uh, some anarchists have blocked me on numerous social medias because of this. <laughs> When I point out socialism is the total state, the socialism yes, is everything is. being controlled by government. It so is. you're telling me as, you know, as a social justice, as a warrior for justice, you, you see that there's a problem. You see that the state is is targeting, uh, you know, minorities in disproportionate mm -hmm. ways. You're, you're seeing that the state is targeting low socioeconomical mm -hmm. um, stratas of society disproportionately. And your solution is more state. 
you know that right that, but it's but it's it, right. i think those are just i think here's the the, the good thing the, the silver lining is i think those people that you see the loud ones on tv those mm-hmm. aren't just any social trust warriors those are the like the cnn safe you know right. um, most of the people i talk to who are from lower socioeconomic backgrounds <laughs> When I wear whatever messaging I wear, whatever you know, whenever I whenever I get into discussions on agorism, people go, no, you know, of course I'm, of course I don't want to pay taxes, of course I hustle right. on the side, of course I don't right. pay what I'm supposed. Right. And this, these are people from because the people in the lowest socioeconomic stratus, they they don't make enough that if they're getting taxed, right. you know, they're making eight dollars an hour, they're getting five of that, and that's right. not enough to survive with the price and cost of living. But if you're making seven dollars an hour under the table, or if you're making, right. you know. Fifty dollars an eighth to you know do right, hustling exactly. whatever you know you're, you get you're keeping every your entire value of yourself you know um, and and I find that they are more with it than than uh, than you know uh, bo- you know not bougie but you know for lack of a better word the uh, sure. the, the sure. limousine libertarians you know sure um, and uh, and you know um, I think that uh, we're we're at a at a beautiful time where people are fully realizing that you know. Oh yeah, no, I don't. I don't actually, I don't actually owe anyone anything just because they say I do. I, I own the fruits of my labor and I can do with it what I want. You know, um, and there's so many so many tools. So that let's we talk. Can use. Let's talk about. Let's talk about the. Uh because you are, I mean, you are a practicing agorist. I obviously am a practicing agorist in a lot of the things. That I think people right. know that about me, but it. You know, not everybody's going to uh, be in the sort of professions that I'm in and doing the things that I'm doing. What can the average person on a day to day? I know this is something you think about, you write about, you talk about and share with people. Share with the audience some of the things that they can do on a day to day to not just do it just to say, save a buck on not uh, being stolen from by the state uh, through taxes, but now that they have a mindset of oh wow this is i'm a, this is actually political action or not political action this is a, this is actually moral action that i'm taking to make the world a more peaceful place what are some things that people can do on a day-to-day basis and uh, what right. can they share with others well i mean we we covered a few of them really quickly from the technological standpoint you can instead of taking a taxi cab that's heavily taxed and regulated by the state you can take an uber in most places uh uber pays very minimal uh, amount of money towards the state. There's even options that are, uh, you know, like uh, donation-based or gift-based Ubers that are, you know, mimicking the Uber uh, business model and, and app um, that are that are untaxed. You Instead of staying at a hotel uh, that caught, like, for example, you're in Las Vegas, every hotel in Las Vegas has a $40 per day uh, room tax, right. uh, hotel tax. Which is being that, increased, that goes- by the way, so they can build a, a stadium for the Raiders. Naturally, right? Because uh, for 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 the circuses that they need, the, right. the gladiators they need yes. to distract people further um, while they steal. Um, but you can you can use uh, Airbnb. You can and once Airbnb starts getting taxed, you can do the old. You know, you can stay with you know you can stay with someone you find on Craigslist and uh, you know offer them cash or a, a gift. That's uh, the, the phrasing is key if we want to protect our asses here. You know, a gift uh, or a donation. Um, I wrote an article about tipping. Uh, that was one of my the only thing I've ever published. Uh, I, Dan Sanchez over at Fee was and and Jeff Tucker were gracious enough to have me publish my article. Uh, Tip with cash, free the world. If you go look that article up, it explains how I I give a talk every time I tip a waiter or a waitress at a restaurant. I tip in cash, and that's because and waiters and waitresses are all agorists. They know exactly what we're talking about. They receive cash tips and they put it in their pocket. They don't uh, have to claim it. They they they're supposed to, but they don't. Uh, almost, almost uniformly, they don't. A few restaurants that I refuse to go to now uh, uh, make it mandated that they claim their cash tips. But if you if you tip on a credit card, that automatically gets entered into a system. If you tip in cash, then it's at the discretion of the server who did all the work and ser- and provide you with the service. And uh, you know, it's up to them how they're going to uh, to divvy up that money and spend that money. And almost uniformly, I've had servers respond, "Oh yeah, I never." I never claim my cash tips, um, you know, and that, you know, using Bitcoin, using cash, uh, using, you know, using um, uh, payment methods that are undetectable um, is another way. You know, you, you can uh, you, you can pay people instead of, you know, paying people through um, a, a, a credit card or, um, you know, a check. Um, and the, the, in L.A., there's places that are cash only. That's pretty Korean, much the uh, cash only Korean grocer is like living yeah, in L.A. You, much you know, saying, yeah, it's traditional. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, I mean, and and 
and you can go you know, same, the thing is is you, you, people are already doing agorist activities they're paying their friends back in cash they're not mm-hmm. paying taxes on that i mean basically it's avoiding it's avoiding uh, getting stolen from at any time you know anytime uh, you own or uh, or do anything that the state forbids you from that doesn't harm anyone else then you're an agorist anytime that you're taking part in peaceful nonviolent and entirely voluntary association with others you're an agorist so um, it's not like oh the black market you gotta sell you're a drug dealer if you're an agorist like no you any uh, you know if you build if you build a shed in your backyard of your house without getting your, a permit right without a permit then you're an agorist if you if you build an, an addition onto your house if you put a you know if you put a, a deck on on the back of your house without permission without paying for some bs fine you're an agorist you know and i think um you know there's going to be some repercussions to this but the the more we talk about it and the more normalized these ideas get and the more mm-hmm. open we are uh, i mean back i'm from new jersey you know uh growing up uh most of my friends their first jobs was was always were always under the table sure you know yeah, yeah. Um, mine too when mine you're, too when you're when you're not when you're not old enough to work right. uh you know you, you work for five bucks an hour you work for yep. five bucks an hour which now seems like nothing but even now five bucks an hour is more than eight dollars an hour pre-tax right, right. you know um, so, um, there's plenty of ways, you know, Uber, Airbnb, even with getting to security, there's an app called cell 411. It provides security and fire safety and emergency response. That's C E L L 411. 411. Yeah, I've, I've got it. It's great. It's amazing. You know, and, and the more people that use these, the more normal it becomes to use these, the, the, the more commonplace they'll be and the more free people will be to do so because they don't have to fear uh, getting, you know, ratted out by the, by their, you know, their, their commie peers, you know? Um, and, and that, that is, that is a legitimate fear. There are, uh, you know, there are people who are so in love with their slavery. They're so, uh, influenced by their Stockholm syndrome that they truly believe, you know, you're, you're evil if you don't let people steal from you to pay for what things you don't want, you know? Um, but you have to, and you have to watch out for those things. But if you, if the more we talk, uh, the, the more I talk about this, the more I find people messaging me privately or, or calling me or texting me and saying, you know, I, I never like your statuses because I'm afraid. And this is telling. I'm afraid of the repercussions. I'm afraid of people seeing that I'm. I agree with you, but I agree with you. And that message has come back to me more and more and more over the last two years. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the seven years, than compared to the five years before that combined and more in the last you know more in the last three months at the trump the trump election oh, oh yeah God. for sure yeah. for sure but um but you know you can you can learn more about these things um you can you can read the, the libertarian uh new libertarian manifesto by sam Konkin. um you can read his other book which is the agorist primer counter economics total freedom and you um you can there's plenty of stuff on agorist.info it's a website www.agorist.info agorist.info um, I'll be putting out an article on my Medium, which is at Kalman. It's the at symbol K A L L M A N. Um, is my Medium. It's on my Twitter. It'll be on my Twitter. It'll, you know, it'll be links. It'll be and we'll and we'll re we'll retweet it and put a, a link to that as well. I'm interested yeah. to read this article now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's 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 just honestly, it's just a 101. It's it's a 21st century. I'm gonna call it a 21st century introduction to agorism. Um, I just I I'm super paranoid about my writing this will be the second thing i ever put out there like re- and try to get published so or i didn't even try to get the first thing published but i both on agorism you know and it's something i feel strongly about i feel um you know and it's worth the risk for me because while you say i'm a practicing agorist you know most of my income is actually sure. tax sure i'm sure, not sure. at right. all i'm not even ni- i'm not even 90 percent i'm or excuse me i am not even 10 percent free i'm i'm 90 percent taxed but the goal is to move towards 100%. And like we've gone over a few ways to do it. I, c- I could move to Costa Rica. I could sure. get a travel visa and, and work as a, you know, and, and make up to X amount without having the government steal from me. But I, I'd rather stay and fight. I'd rather be civilly disobedient and live the way I am accustomed to in society and just remove that group of thieves and robbers from my life. And, you know, while on the one hand, my activism in theory and philosophy is is helping people understand why, this agorism is an action that will show people how, and not only show them how, but show them how much better life is when you're free. Because you're getting to keep 100% of your labor, and you're getting to keep 100% of your profit and 100% of your output, instead of having someone steal some of it from you. Well, and, you, know, you, get, and to par- you get to participate in a, a moral society that you get to be the most moral, be the most consistent. Um, 
Yeah, man, it's, I, I think that that's, a, I think we covered it very well. We've got so many other topics to cover you and I, I think in the coming years, there's so much to this movement, but uh, yeah, this was great. I really, I really enjoyed having you on. I think we're going to leave it there for now, Thanks but so you're, you'll, you will come back on, of course, right? <laughs> Oh man, twist my arm. Dude. <laughs> so, so yeah, we should uh, just, what we need to do, Vin, is we need to record half of our phone calls could be uh, like hour long. Yeah, that, talks, like, <laughs> that would be from our SoundCloud or something. I've, every, from now on, that's the rule. Every time I talk to you on the phone, I'm hitting record and I'm going to, well, I'm gonna well, that. let's be, let's be careful about that. We don't know who's listening to us, but all right. Oh, come on. They're, <laughs> they're listening regardless. You know, they're listening. Peter Coleman, Mises Institute ambassador. Thank you for so much for coming on. We'll have you back on again. It was great. Thank you, Thanks, man. Yeah. <laughs> Always a good time. Always a good time with Peter. So, Christian, covered a little covered a little agorism today. Yeah. Good stuff, right? Great stuff. Yeah. It's uh, stuff. I, I really encourage everybody to read. I uh, New Libertarian Manifesto was his first book. Um, it's it's a little he's a little more passionate in that one. Mm -hmm. uh, Agoras Primer is definitely one that I would suggest for people to get just like the 101. But we'll put up Peter's article too because I'm sure that that's going to be really great. Obviously, these books were written written a while ago, but the yeah. the theory it, it it still stands. I mean, the one thing that um, that sticks out to me, man, is it's it, it all the timing of all of this seems really right. I know a lot of people are scared right now mm -hmm. you know um what it, how do how do you feel over these last i guess it's been almost two months now i mean where is your where is your mind at in terms of a an unsteadiness or are you more steady more confident about things where where are you at personally yeah so that's a very good question um it really comes down to intention mm -hmm. you know and and morals and I, we got into it i think on show three or four and it was stating that this is not a political mm -hmm. movement. It's a moral movement. Mm -hmm. So you take something like agorism, you take something like the idea of freedom, and you look at that and you say, well, freedom for me is also responsibility to my moral beliefs, you know? Yeah. So in order for me to really uh, be free, my intention has to be correct because I need to uh, come from that position of of knowing that I'm doing the right thing, mm. and also with the government, it can very easily. And we talked about this a little bit earlier in the show too. It can be a little confusing, so maybe it confuses people to do what would be wrong, but mm -hmm. it's force that's that's mm -hmm. that's moving them in that direction. So look at the intention um, when you find if you look at your intention and if your intention's correct. You may not always be doing, you may make a mistake, but if your intention is correct, then you can go back to that and, and figure it out. So, Wow. I don't, I don't think, I think, I think you just ended the show out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have anything better to say. I don't have anything better to say. So I guess I will just say, uh, I guess I'll just say goodbye to the people. Thank you very much. Yeah. Awesome. Christian, thank you for that. So uh, it's been another great show. I want to thank Peter Coleman from the Mises Institute for coming on. And as always, uh, Christian. And thank you, Christian, for ending that out. Uh, you can check us out again next week, Monday, 10 a.m. Pacific time. You can get the archives of the show, watch the full show back at youtube.com slash Vin Armani. Uh, and also you can get our podcast on um, Stitcher and iTunes. You can just do vinarmani.com slash iTunes, vinarmani.com slash Stitcher. If you're watching on Facebook or on YouTube right now, uh, those links are in the description. I would encourage you to go and visit Mises.org and also to research more on our topic, agorism. It's really interesting, and I think that it's going to provide some wonderful solutions for the future and allow you to move with that right moral intention. So thank you for tuning in, and we will see you next week.